welcome to the Provoke and Inspire live stream. We are so happy that you are with us today, right, fellas? Yes, so that, happy. that is true. Luke's, it Luke's is true, Ben. Shout happy. Oh, man. I'm like, you guys are like muzzled dogs. You know, you're necessary yep. and uh, you keep the house safe, but the feeding gets old. And, uh, you know, sometimes you're unsanitary. Uh, anyway, no, no, I know that you're, I've told you, don't all jump in at once. It makes for this big, you know, cacophony of nonsense. Well, but you can't you guys have been ask quite us restrained. all a question at the same time then. Otherwise, we all just jump in. Yeah, that's I could, true. But yeah, that's true. some, you know, have you ever had that when you're going around a corner and then a, then they, the police put like this sharp uh, light in your face and then it stuns you and you can't speak? Have you ever had that? No. Uh, no. No. Yeah, oh, that I sounds like something never heard to of you. that. Actually. Yeah, so I kind of had that because of Chad's forehead. It like blinded me, and then I couldn't speak. Nice. That's one of my oh. many gifts, David. You're welcome. But what what I will That's... say is that it is used in interrogation because it dulls the senses, and uh, you know you tend to get the information you need. So my, shine on, my I say. Forehead, that is yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, anyway, welcome to the Provoke and Inspire podcast, calling followers of Jesus to radical faith outside of the church. Uh, so grateful that you can join us. Uh, this is actually a bit of an unusual time, and similar to Monday morning, we didn't really give any rhyme or reason for it, um, but we are trying to do some stackage. We're trying to like put a couple episodes in a day. We'll still spread them out. You'll still get them on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, we release them literally at 4 a.m. in the central U.S. time uh, because we're trying to hit your commute. So uh, although many of you aren't commuting because of the COVID crisis, so it's probably just a terrible strategy. strategy. Uh, but nevertheless, that's the that's the thinking. Uh, we but are, they've got to yeah. come out sometime, haven't they, Ben? you yeah. just got to pick a time. Agreed. Uh, here's a couple of ways that you can support this podcast. You can obviously listen, like I assume some of you are doing right now, and will in the future. Uh, you can listen to past podcasts that have come out. Uh, we had a great conversation on Monday, uh, sans Luke, and that's probably why it was great. I mean, can yeah. we just be honest? Um, Sometimes I just like giving you guys a break. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Thank you. Uh, and with the weights had been thence removed from our shoulders, we just sprung forth into a really jolly conversation about loyalty. Uh, but it was really good. It, loyalty is one of those weird things that you can kind of think, ah, oh, is there something to talk about? But it's critical. Like, it is so important, and it is so antithetical to our self-focused age and to our uh, culture of trying but never committing. Uh, and the idea of having someone's back, having a organization's back through thick and thin, uh, not blind loyalty, but, but a real uh, commitment that is based on a love for God and a desire to see someone and something succeed. Uh, that's a rare, beautiful thing that I think we all both need to be for something and hopefully can be the recipients of so check that one out uh, did you guys out. talk about that just because i missed the yeah the episode? we were like yeah. okay so speaking yeah, of that? luke's absence but let's you talk know about loyalty but uh, <laughs> <laughs> was it really being loyal to luke chad what you said by yeah. the way <laughs> true let's just you say know, that was kind of that was kind of the point you know i i figured he'd never go back and listen so yeah. i'm fine you know let's just say what you said between minute 30 and 33 was not right. exactly loyal no. so well, let's just yeah, we'll just yeah. hang that out there for for the right. mystery factor uh thanks for everyone who's joining the live stream uh hello thank you for the shout outs uh, you belly and Ton, the green one. Thank you. I don't know where you are, but likely you're grooming a garden somewhere. Right? Holland. Miss, miss you, Antonius. Yeah, seriously. Sad, sad uh, byproduct of this COVID nonsense is, is the the shrinking of our family, right? We have this amazing family from all over the world. And normally our rhythms and ministry patterns put us in contact with people that you kind of get used to seeing, right? You get to You get used to seeing these pockets of people from different parts of the world because of speaking or conferences or schools or tours and it's sad you know as my as my social media keeps reminding me of things that have happened a year ago or five years ago or whatever it's it's rough because this is usually the season when i get to see a lot of people so hmm. anyway uh, emma says hey hey from minneapolis uh thank you for your increasing listenership she's been a very loyal listener uh, we really do appreciate that. And a, and a member of our local team here, which uh, has been doing outreaches uh, every Saturday and Lord willing, weather willing, this Saturday as well. So, Emma, we really appreciate you. Angelo, we love you. And boom. What does that mean? It means boom. To us. <laughs> boom. I yeah. love you. Boom. My love for you knows no bounds, It Angelo. knows no bounds. Like the horizon no. or the depth of the sea, it shall never be fully plumbed. Right, Chad? Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. You stole the word straight out of my mouth. Meanwhile, it looks like Chad, like, 
I don't know. He took like a SimCity top screen and turned it into a shirt, and he's now wearing it, which I'm into. Hey, man, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm into it. All right, here we go. We're going to talk about dissonance and doubt. Uh, this is a topic that uh, it, it's not exactly lighthearted, uh, and it's hard to transition into, but I, I think it's really, really important, and I think we've we've probably covered it in other ways in various topics, uh, but maybe never this directly. Uh, and... and What's sad is it's, it's, I think, very much connected to what's in vogue in, in terms of deconstructionism and a lot of people coming out of their faith and doubt tends to sort of be the the beginning, the first domino, these doubts, and then they stack up and, and eventually people tend to deconstruct their, their faith. And and I think that, um, honestly, I've been on this journey of, of really discovering that there is real beauty in the mystery and in the tensions and in the unknowns of my faith with God, and that I think when you're a new believer or a young believer, you can tend to think that everything has to make perfect sense, that there can be no, nothing left unresolved. You know, dissonance in a musical sense is just, it's a clash. It, it's something that's not satisfying or, or like resolving in you. There, there's a tension. Uh, and doubt can be a similar thing. I think there's in some ways synonymous. Um, but I don't know. I've just increasingly discovered that doubt is necessary. It's critical, and it and and the problem is we have we have allowed an element of um, sort of detractors of the faith to claim doubt rather than making it an important part of what every Christian needs to have and wrestle with. So, uh, no easy way to launch into this, but maybe starting with you, Luke, since you were absent. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. What did what are your thoughts on the Punishment. topic of doubt and dissonance? I mean, let me just read one quick definition. Sorry, it's yeah. Uh, there's a great uh, quote here from Austin Fisher who wrote Faith in the Shadows, and uh, there's an article I shared with you guys that we can link, which was really, I thought, a pretty compelling article. Uh, But he says, Doubt sets in when the seemingly impossible claims and promises of Christian faith collide with the savage and bewildering facts of life. And I mean, that's kind of it, right? That is a, like, like even in this recent really awesome Todd White sermon where he's talking about, if I tell you that come to Jesus and everything will be easy, what happens when life gets hard? That's mm. when the dissonance and the doubt can set in, uh, and so I think it's important we talk about that. Yeah, I think for me it's important to differentiate or to def- like to define doubt and to yeah. differentiate some different aspects of doubt for me because um, I think there are there's sometimes we talk about doubt and we mean um, questions or difficulties in our faith, um, and yet for me the the term doubt in itself would be more. Uh, having a question and and actually deciding that um, I I don't have the answer, therefore there's something wrong, and so th- and, and therefore in a sense uh, drifting from my faith. And I think it's important to differentiate those two things. I and then in that way, I kind of to start with the dissonance. I don't fully agree with um, that statement. From could you repeat his name again? Or, uh, Austin Fisher. Austin Fisher. Thanks, because I. Th- you know, the, for me, it's it's so important to to recognize that one of the reasons I follow Jesus and I believe the Bible to be true is because it does show the facts of life that it that it and that it is part of life and it is fact. And so, yes, many claims in Christianity um, involve the miraculous, which is God um, changing the course of of what's normal, of what's natural, but it's it's also um, very much how life is in itself. And, and in that sense, you know, it's kind of like Francis Schaeffer used to say that, that the Christian worldview is the best description of reality and of facts. And, and that's important for me. So to, I, I think that questions are important to my faith. I, and, and if I don't question and I don't think more deeply and mm. if I just accept things blindly and I, and I don't really think about them, then that's dangerous. But doubt for me is a, is a step further, which you know, and I'm sure we'll debate this out a bit in this conversation, but I, I actually don't think doubt is a good thing, and I don't think it needs to be part of our faith. Yeah. What do you guys think? Well, my faith really became alive for me when I questioned things, um, to be honest. <clears throat> you know, I grew up uh, in, a, in a home where I went to, ch- you know, they brought me to church every Sunday. My parents were strong believers, but it wasn't until I started to question everything, not not in a because I wanted to really, for the first time, understand Jesus. And yeah, I started sincere, sincere, sincere right. Yeah. And, and for the first time, I really 
read the Bible and I'd read things that Jesus said, and I would wrestle with it. You know, it's uh, I'll, like we talk about, we've talked about this before, but it's like the breakthrough came for me when I read the Bible in a non-religious way where I really looked at it and I thought, how does this match up with my, my life? And Jesus says this, but I'm experiencing that and why and and being hungry enough to to keep pressing in until I got some kind of resolution or peace or answer in that question. And that's when everything became alive for me. So I think when you just when you don't have a thinking faith, what it's just uh I don't know how alive it is, to be honest. And I think it can be just a cultural thing that you adopt. But I think for me personally, when my my faith became alive, when I started to see God moving in my in my, my life and my friend's life, when I actually received the, the calling that God had placed on me, it was when I started to question authentically the things that I read and 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 ask God to reveal to me the things I didn't understand. Yeah, and I, I I can kind of relate with um, what David's saying. You know, I think for me, this conversation's really interesting now than the timing of it now because sure, a yeah. season ago, I would have been like, well, you know, for those people that are doubting or that dealing with dissonance, you know, I think that's an interesting word because I don't, I, it's, um, it, I don't know, maybe it, maybe it kind of like, meets the fills in the gap between doubt and, and like insecurity at somewhere in between. But, but for me, this is, this is very, uh, this is very real because it's what I'm, what I'd like to say I've already, I've just come out of, but what I think I am still sort of like struggling through although thankfully not as severely as, as maybe at the darkest point of life. But for me, you know, I think for a lot of people that the struggle right now is a uh, maybe a theological one or, a, or a mental right. one or like a, a societal one or uh, any number of, of factors. And I, I would, when I begin to kind of like drill down on why, I've doubted why, why I've dealt with this, this idea of dissonance. It was much more a lack of feeling, uh, uh, like a blah, like a lack of passion where once I was alive and fiery and excited about Jesus, I just kind of grew, um, gradually less and less passionate or excited about Jesus. And right. it wasn't, my, my struggle hasn't really been, Jesus, are you real? Is Christianity real? Um, it's, uh, it's more just like, I don't really feel it. You know, I'm just like, man, I don't like, I just don't know if I, if, right. if I'm bought in right now, you know? And so anyway, I guess that's kind of, I think that it's important to maybe set the groundwork and just, yeah. just to, just so people listening know, like there are many different aspects to doubt or, or to right. a, a faith struggle. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, you know, what Luke said when he said he doesn't believe doubt should be a well, part of our faith journey. I think that's an interesting, I mean, he's wrong. Of course I'm right. But <laughs> beyond that, it's interesting. <laughs> but what I think what you, what, what Luke said, and I agree is that it's so much about the definition, right? And, and a lot of times that that is the struggle is that it, it's both the definition and then also um, the the vibe that the word carries or the the weight that it carries depending on the context that it's in and so doubt can carry with it a, a negative cynical um, arrogant vibe or it can be sincere and questioning and and part of just the the reality of being a human being see for me I feel like doubt in some ways or dissonance is, is just a recognition that I'm not God and, and simply calling something that exists what it is and, and not being in denial of that, that, that it's probably having secret or unresolved doubt is probably riskier than just being honest and saying, yeah. I know that my faith is For not sure. based on perfect sensory evidence. And honestly, I think a faith that is claims or attempts to be based on perfect sensory evidence is going to fall because it's not meant to be about that. God, I don't, yes, I agree with you. I'm passionate about the idea that, that the Christian worldview is the most rational one. It is the one that lines up both. Uh, it, it aligns best with reality and makes most sense in light of our experiences, but it's not purely rational. It's mm -hmm. not purely, you can find 
figure out every answer to every question you might have and resolve it perfectly within the limits of your own senses. There, that is where faith comes in, not faith in the absence of evidence, but faith based on good evidence. Mm-hmm. But I think calling doubt what it is and, and making it an okay thing, first of all, is just accepting reality because we're human. And mm-hmm. it's also saying that I'm not God, and so therefore, by definition, I'm not going to perfectly understand everything. If I could, yeah. would it be God? Would be yeah. the thing I'm trying to believe in be God if I could perfectly rationally understand it? Yeah, and I think I think that's right. But then I would call that questioning. So, so sure. for me, um, and the reason why I didn't fully agree with the the, the comment, the the quote from from Austin Fisher is because he he says um, when the seemingly impossible um, claims of Christianity clash with the just the bewildering facts of life, right? And right. and so. What I struggle with that is, um, I guess he means the miraculous um, claims of Christianity, like, because, uh, you know, to, to say they're impossible for man. Yeah, they're possible for God. I, I get that's what, what sure. he's saying. Um, but to say they clash with the facts of life is to say, look, there's Christianity here that says everything's going to be amazing and God's going to move powerfully and you're going to be healed. And it's kind of that perspective, I guess, of faith. And then there's life and life's hard. And, you know, and when those things clash, you're going to have doubts. That's just how it is. And, and I, that doesn't sit right with sure. me. So for me, what you just said, Ben, is right. Like, um, I do not understand God and I won't fully understand um, many aspects of him. That's just not human. And, and so I do question and and so I ask, and I, I can say, God, I don't understand this, or God, I my, I don't get it, or I don't agree with it, and I'm struggling with this, and I can ask those questions. But doubt for me is like when I actually say, Look, I I can't trust you because I I doubt you, you know. So if, like if I in a normal relationship, if I if I'm like you know with 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 Ben, you're my friend, and and you do something that I don't get. Right. I can ask you questions. I can say, Ben, I don't understand this. Can you explain it better? This doesn't make sense to me. And uh, I'm not sure this is how I would do it, how I would say it. We can have that conversation. But if I come to you and I say, Ben, I doubt you. I don't like to me, that's the same thing as saying I don't really trust you anymore. And when there's not a trust, there's not a relationship. And that's what I'm trying to differentiate here, because I think that that's key. I need to question. I need to get dig deeper, which is what I think all you guys are saying. And also, I'd say that while while I don't think doubt needs to or should be part of our faith, it is in the sense that right. I doubt, I have doubts, and we all have doubts. And that's part of, I think, part of the human condition. But maybe what I'm trying to argue here is that it doesn't have to be, and neither do I think that's what Jesus wants it to be. I don't think Jesus wants us to doubt. I think he wants us to question, but I don't think he wants us to doubt. And, you know, we, you know if we're going to bring up, for instance, Thomas. Right. The doubter. I think Jesus' the response imagine, there is... Do you imagine is, having that title? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, Thomas Wait, the So which, which apostle were you again? Oh, that's <laughs> right. Chad the vagabond. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Jesus' response to him is, is, is how I understand it, because he responds with grace, as he will do every time sure. with all of us. We all have doubts. That's, that right. is part of our human condition, and he responds with grace. But he doesn't condone it in like saying, hey, that was great. Good job. You had, you, you doubted me. He, Your he doubts says, are awesome. Yeah. He, he says, he, he, he turns up, he shows himself to Thomas, but then he says, um, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. And Jesus constantly talks about this in, throughout the gospels. He'll, cond- he'll, um, he'll encourage faith. He doesn't encourage doubt. Right. And that's the point I'm trying so, to think about here. So let me, and I'll bring you in on this, David. I think Part of, though, what I, I guess I was trying to get at before is that we can have dissonance that's that's kind of subtle and subconscious or doubt that's subtle and subconscious, and it can be, uh, there can be an added pressure to suppress it because of our culture, our Christian culture that says to doubt or to question or to have any sort of dissonance mm. is wrong, yeah. and, and that adds this, 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 this encouragement or this incentive to, to press it down, and, and I guess I'm trying to say is, we need people to just be what they are. Like, mm-hmm. just you got to just come to Jesus the way you are. Thomas needed to see Jesus the wounds, and and you're right. He does say at the end, "Blessed are those that don't need to see." But he gave Thomas what he needed. Like he wasn't mm-hmm. he he was willing to meet Thomas where he was at. And 
and and so I guess for me, it's like I'd rather have the church be a place where people say, "Come as you are." You know, it's a cliche we often say, but but really, like on the full spectrum from some minor confusions on the right end to full on major doubts and questions on the left end, I think Jesus would still say, "Come to me," and and I'm not gonna I'm gonna, you know, he didn't say to Thomas like. No, that's ridiculous. He uh, look at me. I'm alive. Hello, I'm right <laughs> here. He said, "No, go ahead." Like he went to a pretty extreme degrees to prove yeah. to Thomas that he was real, right? That what had happened had happened. And to me, I think that I just don't like, in the same way that it annoys me that deconstructionism, which should just be a healthy part of our spiritual journey to then reconstruct a better faith, has been hijacked by a certain stream of Christianity. That, that also likes to claim the doubt and dissonance thing. Like, we're the only home for those things. And then it pushes people out with those doubts and dissonances to a place of unbelief, where mm-hmm. doubt could be used, in, I think, in a powerful way to lead people back to Jesus, regardless of how severe the doubt might be. What do you, what, what do you think about that, David? Yeah, I well, like I said before, when I started to ask honest questions and I started to not just pretend I was feeling a certain way when I wasn't and bring that before God— that's when I started, my relationship actually started when I was not saying to God the things I thought he wanted to hear, but saying the things that I really felt. And uh, that changed everything for me. But one of the things I'm wondering is, in what I've observed, is that doubt can come when I'm following a false Jesus, when when a false Jesus is presented to me, and that you see today in a lot of places. You know, this Jesus says, there'll be no problems. I'm going to get I'm going to be financially rich. I'm going to have no struggles. And so then when I, when, and he's going to, he's always going to heal people when I pray for them. Um, everything is always going to work out. And so this is the Jesus I come to, which is, I believe, a false Jesus. And so then when I'm, not everyone I pray for gets healed, even though I firmly believe in healing. Uh, when God doesn't answer everything that I pray, when I don't get rich, when I still have to face difficult things, then I doubt because the Jesus I'm following isn't the real Jesus, you know, and Jesus did not present himself that way. Uh, you know, like in John 16, 33, he said, I have said this to you so that you may have peace in the world. You will have tribulation. You don't hear that preached very often when it come to Jesus, because you, you, you will have tribulation. Hard, yeah. yeah. But then he doesn't leave it there. He says, take, take heart. I have overcome the world. So, it's not, it's not this Pollyannic kind of Santa Claus guy that just you go to him whenever you need something and sit on his lap and he, he gives it to you. It's about a Jesus that gives you what you need to face life in, in the real world that we live in. And I think mm-hmm. when, when Jesus, this false Jesus is presented to us and he doesn't add up, then, yeah. then doubts. That's come big. In. And Thomas, right, was probably like all of the disciples who, <laughs> despite Jesus saying it over and over, still didn't really believe that Jesus was going to die, right? They, they were still like, what? Mm. No, no, you're not going to do that. And so again, I, to your point, he just could not wrap his mind around a dying and rising Messiah. Like that was so not part of the Jewish understanding of things, despite what atheists might say, and that's a that's a tangent, that, that there's just no way, like it was crazy. Like they would never believe that. And so, yeah, I agree. And again, a little bit of my point as well is, if we turn our our uh, belief in God into this systematized rational system of either rationality or theology, where God's got to fit perfectly into my box, and a lot of times we grow up that way, right? Like we grow up thinking, "Oh, God's He's the answer to everything," and we don't we we don't even we just grow up unquestioning. You, know, you think of that bright eyed naive kid that's like, "Well, God did it. Everything's it's just easy." And 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 I'm not saying we should become cynical, but but the truth is, God is also not this test tubable rational little system that we can empirically prove to everyone and where there is no sense of where there's some faith and there's some humanity mixed into it. And I think that's also part of it. When we present this false sense of Jesus, where he is this perfect rational system, and then he confronts a challenging world where, you know, even in this article, it says, I don't want to get to the point where I'm at a funeral for a dead child and it doesn't at a gut wrenching level, make me go, God, I don't get this. I don't understand why you would do this. That's not to say you you deny God in that moment, but we're human, and it's it's brutal and it's hard. And I think it's we need to make space for that, not not so that we abandon our faith, but in a weird way, I think a 
the absence of doubt is a weaker faith. I mean, there's that Tim, Tim Keller quote, uh, if I can find it. I don't know if I can. But uh, it, it's kind of, basically, he says, you know, faith without doubt is like a body without antibodies. It's susceptible to attack. And you see that. You see the young, naive Christian go out into the real world and who's, who's never really wrestled with the legitimately difficult parts of being a follower of Jesus. And the first resistance, the first trial, the first hardship, and they just, they're like the house that was not built on a foundation. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they, they just get blown over. So I think doubt is critical. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking about how um, I think our culture, our context right now creates a specific difficulty for us to deal with this stuff. And maybe that's why doubt is such an important issue to deal with right now. And for me, it's because there's two sides um, that that are, uh, are, are not a, an accurate view or, or, or have issues. So on one side, in, in the Christian world, we have, I think, come to a, a wrong understanding of faith. In a lot of circles, I feel like when we talk about faith, we, we, we're actually describing something like positive thinking. We're saying, look, you've, you've got to uh, know this is going to happen. You've got to believe it. it's about knowing this is, and, and it's kind of like an energy. You've got to feel and you've got to force it. You've got to be like, posi- think positively. And sometimes the way people pray for each other or pray for healing sounds to me more like positive thinking than faith. And when I look through the Bible at the word faith, one of the easiest ways for me to understand it is that faith is leaning on God. On God. It's trusting in him. It's saying, God, you know I don't. And, and it's um, trusting in him for his promises. It's praying, believing in that sense. But it is a leaning on. And it's not a, I can make this happen if I believe it strongly enough. If I feel it strongly enough. If I think it positively enough, I'll make it happen. No, it's a leaning on God. So for me, that, that creates a weak faith. Because every time um, faith is challenged, is again, put in contrast with the reality of life, the issues in life, then we can't deal with it. And and so I'd say that's a wrong understanding of faith because I think faith should include, our faith, our Christian faith includes um, children dying right now. It, it, it includes the difficulties of life. And unless my faith includes it, then I can't get through faith without doubting because right. it doesn't work together. And, and so I, and I'm not talking about this from an academic sense, from a logical sense. I'm saying that um, it's our understanding of the world. If our understanding of the world is accurate, um, biblical, I believe, then we, are, then we know that suffering happens right now. And as David just pointed out, we're promised tribulation. We're promised right. suffering and struggles. And so then, then we're not surprised by it. We shouldn't be right. surprised by pain in the world today. The Bible talks about it and says that it's part of life. And just yeah. to finish the idea, the other side that I think creates a problem is this um, de- the deconstruction um, aspect of our culture, which is a, often a skeptical doubting of things rather sure. than a constructive questioning of things. And so on one side, you've got this weak faith, I think, that is more like positive thinking. And on the other side, you've got this um, secular skeptical questioning, which isn't really interested in finding right. out something, in learning. It's, it's interested in destroying and knocking down and saying, look, I don't like this, so I'm going to find ways to pull it apart. Or it's kind of like pulling it apart without the, the, the belief that there is an end to it. There's, there's right. a ground to find. And those two things combined create a really difficult environment for us. And it does yeah. create a lot of doubt. And we just need to let, again, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but we need to let people be who and what they are at that moment, just very transparently, because mm. just to play the devil's advocate, I can hear someone saying, well, wait, so I'm start. I'm supposed to start with the presupposition that, that everything is true and then work out my doubt from that point. Well, that, that sounds a little circular. And so I think the key is, you know, <laughs> maybe this is a weird analogy, but it, I, I heard on a leadership podcast that it's like, let your team... Let the people that have your back point out your flaws, because if they don't, the world will, right? Like, get 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 your wounds from your friends, because they're going to be the ones who actually, in theory, care about you and want to see you improve. Mm-hmm. In the same way, let the church, let your family be the one that help you work these doubts out. And that's part of the problem in all of this, is I think a lot of people have felt like they can't be who they are honestly, not skeptically, not cynically, not with an agenda, but sincerely where they are in the context of family and so then they, they go elsewhere, and fair mm-hmm. enough, right? And I think that's part of the challenge is I yeah. continue to say we, we have got to let – doubt is, is, a, is a litmus test. It's a powerful indicator of what's true, and th- there is no use in pretending 
we aren't something that we're not because then we're either going to suppress it and it'll come out in a different way uh, or we just won't really deal with the questions that we actually have. And I th- but I do think the key is that we're really sincerely asking God to show us because <clears throat> I've given this example before, but I can remember when I was making, I was going to go to India and uh, there was this pastor that was in, in India and he was sleeping in his van with his two sons and someone lit the van on fire and he was burned to death, this pastor mm-hmm. and his two sons. And I was just getting ready to go to India and I was, uh, I, 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 read this, you know, and then I was going for a walk before I was going to speak somewhere. And I was thinking, God, how can I trust you? You know, when you, when here's this humble pastor in India, sleeping in his van with his two sons, and you, you let this happen. How can I trust you? You know, I didn't pretend that it was okay. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't gloss it over. I was honest before God, God, I, how can I trust you? And in that sincere crying out to Jesus, I felt him speak to me like I've ever had him speak to me before. And I felt like he said, David, I was with that pastor. I was, I was in the van. I was in the van with that pastor and his two sons. And if I ask you to be in a van like that, I'll be with you too. And it was so strong and it was so God speaking to me, basically, yes, we live in a, a, the world is not we are not in heaven. And if I ask you to go through something like that, I'll be with you. And I want you to know I was with that pastor and his two sons. So I think God wants to speak to us about these things. It's not just about, yeah, people die. Yeah. If I'm at a, a funeral, you know, and I see that some child has died, he wants to give us, he wants to speak to us in those things, not just, mm. okay, all right, well, the world is terrible, and I guess I just he- have to accept it. And he doesn't mm. expect us to be just robots or, or right, completely exactly. rational. He, he knows he made us. He knows. And it's this guttural, real, honest reaction to the place that we're at. And so I, I think that's amazing. I think God totally allows space for that. Mm. And, and, and the sad thing is, is that Jesus offers the most incredible apologetic for evil. He, he entered into evil. He was not this lofty God that, the, you know, we don't have an unsympathetic high priest. And so the truth is... I don't think our doubt leads to this flimsy understanding of God. I think that it needs to lead to a more robust understanding of God because I think the way, and again, I have lived an incredibly easy life compared to the things you hear or read or in history, but but it seems that historically Christians have had incredible, powerful witness in the midst of suffering. You think mm. of the Holocaust, you get the, these powerful <laughs> testimonies of sacrifice in the midst of suffering. So, so I, I don't think... <laughs> I, I think we can, and, and, and still those people, I imagine, had those those moments of crying out to God and saying, why would you let the Holocaust happen? Why would you? Mm-hmm. And yet there's this, God is there with you, and the, the God with us. That's what's so distinct about Jesus, right? It's not God prescribing some rational approach to dealing with problems. It's, it isn't easy to understand. It's okay that you doubt, but what you have that's better than your doubts is me. Mm-hmm. That's what I, I will give you. I'm with you, and I'm not unsympathetic to that. And, and I think that is the critical distinction. Now, just to quickly pivot, I think the problem with this is the slippery slope relativism vibe of this. It's like, is there nothing solid, right? Is everything just, we're just kind of floating in the sea and nothing solid? Isn't that part of the resistance to this chat is that people can think, well, if I doubt everything and if doubt becomes so normalized and so acceptable, what happens? Does my doubt just erode my foundations to one day I wake up and... The house is down, and 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 doubt had its had the last laugh. Yeah, I think in some ways it's it kind of points to the fact whether whether it's a false Jesus, the Holocaust, the death of a child, the pat, you know, the injustice of pastor and sons being burned alive, you know, whatever the the disconnect, the hurt, the doubt, the issue is, it, if if we aren't willing to be honest enough with ourselves as a starting point with others and begin to, to really feel the pain. And like David felt the pain of the, of that like injustice for the, for that pastor, like, but God, how can I trust you Mm -hmm. when, when that happens? So I think until we begin, and for me, I think there was a, and maybe others can relate with this, like before I was willing to get down into the ugly mess of the pain and the hurt and the disappointments of 
my experience that that have led to to maybe the doubts um is is just like what an alcoholic does just numbs himself you know and and sin becomes so attractive and sin becomes the allure and sin becomes this kind of like uh you know the flat well, well if because this is such a burden and such a weight, like, Oh, I got to figure all this out. I'm in full-time ministry. I'm supposed to be in love with Jesus all the time. And I was, but now I'm struggling. What do I do? Mm. Um, it, it, it really, I think it's just, I think the enemy loves the, the power of distraction and, and just pulling us away from the real, what's the core. So is, is the Holocaust your issue? Is a false Jesus? Is your dad dying from heart disease? Is what, what's at the, is the fact that you've been medicating uh, and coping through life as a, as a addict to fantasy or lust or whatever the thing is until you, you're, you get to that place. And, and then what I think maybe is the most beautiful step, like being willing to say, God, I don't, I'm not sure I even trust you. I'm not sure what I believe about you, Jesus. I'm not sure, but I'd like to share this with you. I yeah. feel so frustrated by this, or I'm so doubtful awesome. about this, or I'm so concerned about this, but can I just share it with you? Because, because maybe there's healing there. And like, may, maybe you, maybe you do actually, maybe all the things that we're saying are true, but I'd never know that unless I was willing to actually bring them to you. And so I think that's, that's been the, the, the really cool thing of where I'm at. It's like, I'm, I'm finally, I'm not, I'm not just like, you know, plugging my ears, like, la, 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 like hear anybody. I don't, I don't want any reproof. I don't want any correction. I don't want any, uh, challenge. Uh, and I'm also, I don't think I'm living in denial. Uh, and I don't think I'm, I'm using substances to cope with, with the challenge. Um, but I think I, I have finally kind of hit that bottom point where, okay, what's the, what's that, what's really underneath all this? What's the motivation for the, for the struggle? And then Jesus, I, I'm going to, I'm going to do the hard work of consistently bringing this to you and, and, and the hard work of actually opening up my heart to people I trust, um, including you to, to go through this. And so anyway, that's a lot, that's a mouthful, but yeah, yeah that's go, awesome. Go for I, it. I think that what you just said, Chad, and also David, that story from India for me is so powerful. That is, I think, the probably the most important message that we could talk about in relation to doubt is that is how do we respond when we're in that place when things happen and doubt comes and questions come and this honest conversation with God is is it right? That's the to me that is faith. That is leaning on God. It's saying, God, I don't get this. I I don't have anywhere else to go, but I don't understand it. And so can you please speak to me, do something, show me. Um, and I think my point before is, is trying, I'm somehow trying to describe that for me, my faith needs to be a faith that can include that. If, if my faith is a faith that, as I was trying to describe before, is a positive thinking one, then it, there shouldn't be room for that. I shouldn't like it's it then it feels like oh man this then it's not working if if there are questions or if there's pain if there's difficulty then there's something not working but the I think the Christian faith as the Bible describes it is one that should include that and therefore part of my faith will be this struggling with God this this questioning this God yeah. help me go deeper and so many men in the Bible did that um, one of the chapters that um, I think is most interesting um, on faith is Hebrews 11. And actually, it's one we quote quite a lot in, a lot in Steiger in our mission, um, he, Hebrews 11, 6, the one that talks about um, seeking God desperately. Um, but that whole chapter is amazing on faith. It, and it starts with the definition of faith. It says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And it's really interesting for me because that um, definition of faith already includes tension in it because it says it's hope it's confidence in a hope and hope is something that it's like i want it to happen i think it's going to happen but it hasn't happened yet and so there's a tension there and and also it's um the second part has a tension because it says it's assurance of what we do not see so it's like i'm i'm trusting in something but i don't know it all i don't understand it all and i don't see it all yet and then all the stories that the heroes of faith that then that chapter lays out 
of Hebrews 11, where it runs through all the heroes of faith. You know, what did Abraham do? What did Sarah do? And, and it goes through all those stories, all show um, a few clear things for me. One, it was all about a relationship. All those people had a relationship with God and they were leaning on him. They were trusting in him, even though they didn't understand many situations, even though, and one of the biggest emphasis in the chapter is all the pain and suffering they went through. So they went through all this tribulation and yet they stood with God because they lent on him. They trusted in him. They had faith in him. They were full of questions, probably lots of things they didn't know and didn't understand lots of pain, but they lent on him. And, and in the end, you have this picture of faith, which I believe is, is the real biblical faith that is a strong one. And one aspect of this faith is that it's now and not yet. And, and there's, there's a movement in the church today that, that is difficult um, and has created some of this, I think, positive thinking faith, which is one that um, sometimes dismisses the not yet. It says it's all got to happen now. And if it doesn't happen now, there's something wrong. And yet the faith of the Bible doesn't show that because that chapter actually ends saying they were promised these things and they died without receiving it. They didn't. Yeah. There's so many things they were promised that they did not get. So it describes a faith where I trust in God, even though I don't get everything I think should happen yeah. now and all the positive things. It's, it's a crazy faith. Yeah, exactly. But I do also believe, like the example I gave of, of the uh, pastor and his two sons in that burning car, God will be with will be with me in the tribulation. You know, if I if I it's like Stephen, right? Steve, it says that his face was like an angel, you know, that his when he spoke it was was such an anointing that it it cut them. And then they picked up stones and they threw it at him. Now, you know, to be stoned to death, I can't think of a more brutal way to die than yeah. having, you know, like now in Saudi Arabia they dump they dump like a, a uh, they use what is like there? A big digger and then yeah, a big digger and just dump it on you. Well, that's not what stoning was like in the Old Testament, or I mean, in in Jesus' time, it was throwing rocks at you. I mean, what a terrible way to die! And it says that he his last words were, "Forgive them; they don't know what they're doing." You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, and there's so there's examples you can read in the Book of the Martyrs and stuff like that. Or you know, we don't have to be so dramatic, but the point is, God is wants to be with me in the difficult times too. He doesn't just want me to to just be stoic about it, I don't think. Yeah. I think he wants to be with me, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. and again, I I the the heart of the question for me is 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 everything are we just floating in midair? And and I you know, as I continue to wrestle through this thing and and God continues to mercifully reveal new things to me, I I feel like the things that matter most we can rest on, right? I, I think that the the most important critical foundation he makes simple. You know, like a child can come to him. It's not so esoteric. It's not so deep and convoluted. Does it make it easy? Absolutely not. But to come into the presence of Jesus, to to know that he came, died, ra raised from the dead, that you can have life through him, that you matter, that your pain matters. These things I think he's made so a child can understand it. And, and I think that's critical because... If this faith required, a, you know, a master's in divin divinity or whatever, if this faith required, a, a, you know, a certain degree of intellect, if it re required a certain degree of experience, then it's a religion. Then it's a religion because there's this, there's human requirements to enter in. So, so I guess for me, there is a foundation in this doubt, and that is that we can know Jesus came, that he mm -hmm. made what needed to be known absolutely knowable for anyone who honestly pursues it. That to me is the foundation. And, and, and on a side note, I, I read a kind of a funny quote related to doubt that I just have to fit in, whether it's in context or not. But one thing that's really funny is it, it basically said, don't forget to doubt your doubt, right? That's kind of the funny thing is doubt kind of it masquerades as, as sort of this untouchable thing. It's kind of how atheists will say, you're all, you know, the Christian is on the defensive and you have to explain everything. And then you turn around and say, well, where did, how do you think the world started? Or where do you mm -hmm. get ethics from? Well, I don't have a view. I'm the, I'm an atheist. I don't have any belief. I, I'm the absence of a belief, you know, and it's, it's this, 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 you know, it's a, it's a disingenuous uh, neutrality in the same way. Be skeptical of your own doubts. Doubts are a tool, but doubt your doubts too, because they don't have, you know what I mean? Like we, we need to take seriously 
the thing that we're doubting, but then also the, the sort of the, the arrogance and pride and the skepticism that can also fuel the very thing that, that we're doubting, you know? And so we need to be careful uh, that, that we have a, a, that we hold doubt in, in, not in this high esteem that to doubt is automatically right. It can become in vogue in our culture. I think where if yes. you're doubting, it's you're somehow more intellectually honest or you're more sincere or, mm-hmm. you know, yes, doubt is a necessary part of being human and it's a tool that God can use. But your, your doubt is just as likely to be filled with with inconsistencies and holes as the very thing that you're doubting. And I think that that matters, despite the circular nature of what I just tried to say. <laughs> yeah, one no, of, it's it's true. Go ahead. One of, the th- one of the things I found to be really challenging, but also really helpful when I went through uh, especially group therapy um, with with a counselor and then several basically addicts talking together and sharing. One of the rules was that you could not give advice. You could say anything you wanted, but you mm-hmm. had to listen and you could not give advice to each other, which is, which for me is as like a fixer and like a doer. And like, I just want to make stuff happen. Was like, Oh, like, man, I just, dude, can I just tell you about Jesus <laughs> or can I just pray for you? And, uh, and yet that taught me something really profound, especially as it relates to doubt and dissonance and all that, is that it, it's it's easy, at least for people with my personality makeup, to want to go around fixing everything for everybody rather than just listening and, and trying to empathize and trying to relate and trying um, to just soak in the the what is that what's at the root of the doubt, what's at the root of the distrust and the disconnect. Um, and all these other D words. Uh, but, <laughs> but if I could just listen, you know, and like not necessarily have to give the like, well, all right, Ben, since you admitted to me that you're struggling with this, my, my recipe for right. your cure is this A, B, C, and D just go do those and you'll be fine. Um, which is not to say that Jesus didn't sometimes give people very specific instructions for different things or, you know, and obviously he did that in many, many ways, but, uh, I, I wonder how sometimes we potentially miss a moment um, yeah. to just sit with someone and, and just just listen mm-hmm. and, yeah, Agreed. take it in. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously, this is not uh, you know, resolve this in 47 minutes. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I doubt many of you out there feel as though you are resolved in all your doubts. Um, <laughs> and as the great, I doubt all of you. And as the great Gary says, I'm listening, Todd. I shall refrain from advising you. <laughs> <laughs> but good. but to get back to this just quickly, I mean, I think there also needs to be uh, an understanding that I can't comprehend God. You yes. know what I mean? There yeah. needs to be a humility, a surrender. You don't come to Jesus standing up, you know, with your fist in the air saying, answer all my doubts. Uh, yeah, I don't right. think that's... You, because if that... I think the modern day Jesus, you can come to that way. You know, the 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 popular Jesus, but the Jesus that rose from the dead, you know, who's, who, uh, whose face is brighter than the sun, this Jesus, you don't stand with your fist in the air. You're, you fall at his feet and go, you know, I surrender to you. And it's, it's that heart of surrender. Then that gives me the ability to, uh, to go through and things that are difficult and to understand things that I don't understand, you know, right. Like it says in Isaiah that that his ways are are not our ways, right. yeah. and I think we need to not be so arrogant to think if I can't figure this out with my puny little brain, right. if I can't explain God in everything that's going on in this world, I'm not going to believe. Well, then you have no idea who God is. Right. And, that, and that comes back to my original premise, and maybe we can wrap it up here. Um, is that doubt is a simple reflection of who we are. Which is why, it, again, I know maybe you semantically disagree with that, Luke, and we don't have to go back to that. But, mm-hmm. but the idea of not, let's just say it like this, the idea of not fully comprehending all of the mysteries of our world, of God, and of ourselves is a reflection of the fact that we are not God. Yeah. So, so to, to accept that on some levels is, is just to accept reality. Uh, and then, as we said, I think God gives us what we, what we need to know. I mean, I heard it said that the root of most heresy is is to remove all mystery from your faith. Right. When you perfectly systemize God, what you do is you fill in gaps that were never meant to be filled in mm-hmm. by two-dimensional creatures looking at a three-dimensional God. And and 
mystery, kind of the tensions kind of keep us fallible, limited human beings kind of right in the tension where God wants us. It's like, no, 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 no. You, you don't got it. If you think you got it, you're going to go too far right. You're going to go too far left. There is a degree of humility that says, I know what I need to know. And then with, with intrepidation and humility, I'm going to ask God to help me understand everything else. And then one day I'll know more. <laughs> but but yeah. the, the, the mystery keeps us from heresy in a lot of ways because we don't try to explain elements of God that our minds are simply incapable of explaining. So... And to remember yeah. that Jesus is constantly coming to us and, and, and that he does, you know, somebody mentioned in the comments here, this is a topic that's really important to address. We need to talk about it more. And just to make the point that the Bible constantly addresses Correct. questions, doubt and struggles. And Jesus constantly comes to people who are in doubt, who are struggling, who have questions and acts with grace like he did with Thomas, Absolutely. where he comes into the room and he does beyond what, what he should have had maybe... To you know, ju injustice or unrighteousness needed to do. He went beyond that. Right. And then Thomas, although he's called the doubting apostle, is the one that gives the in John the clearest declaration of who Jesus is. He says, my God and my Lord. That's the strongest worship line in the gospel of John comes from the mouth of Thomas. Right. Hmm. Yeah. I was just going to, I was just going to say that for something that was really helpful and that has been helpful in this season uh, is to, read and specifically in this case because part of the struggle it's like i can read the bible and and i and i can appreciate the bible but it's almost like this is what i've been reading for so long that it's still it's like almost like it goes over my head and so i have to just like god help me to get from help me to like reapproach this from a new lens and a book that was really helpful in that process was by an author named John Bevere. It's just called God, mm -hmm. where are you? And, uh, and it's basically, it basically deals with, uh, anyone struggling through a season of like, God, where's God in my life? Or like, why is God not doing more? Blah, blah, blah. You know, any number of things. And, um, I think just like, yeah, that, that place of God, just would you just meet me in the in in the simplest of terms and kind of yeah. like I like what Luke said, you know, it, at the end of Hebrews 11 is like, here's this like unfulfilled uh, ex experience of expectations hoped mm. for and, and kind of like the big well, basically the the strongest chapter on faith ends with with a question mark, you know, like exactly. that yeah. that ought to be pretty encouraging <laughs> to to anyone like me that's like, well, God or any of us, you know, like, well, God, what <laughs> yeah. about this or that? <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Guys, awesome conversation. Luke, it's good to have you back. And uh, yes, it is. And uh, yeah, I don't know what in the end of the day you'll be called. Maybe not doubting Luke. Maybe it'll be like Luke, <laughs> Luke the tiny suited. Or Chad, the shiny one. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, I'm not. Uh, Luke's the shiny David one today. I mean, look at. David. I am. Sorry. I, I sun, have granted Luke my in shirt. Poland. Yeah. <laughs> the sun is setting in Poland, and it's yeah. in my face. Yeah, yeah you're shining brightly on the on the empire that is Luke. Uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you for listening to the Provoke and Inspire podcast. Uh, again, share this with somebody uh, who, I, again, despite the sort of humorous Jack ending Roberts. here, I think that this is Boom. A, a critical conversation. Um, and, and again, on ending on this note, Jesus was merciful with doubters. I mean, is there any yeah. greater example beyond Thomas than his bumbling gang mm -hmm. of dudes who were just getting it wrong all the time mm -hmm. and, and Jesus was still merciful to them, right? Like he, he's cool with where you're at. Be sincere, look for him. He'll, you'll, and, and do that with an honest heart and you'll find him. And, and God is with us ultimately in that is what matters most. So mm. uh, this will come out in a couple of days. Uh, we're actually going to, the ladies and I are going to be recording another episode in, in like two hours. So my is brain's the like, same, the same subject? Yeah, same subject. We're going to contradict <laughs> everything you said. I'm going to, I'm just going to throw <laughs> all y'all under the bus. Nice. No loyalty. Hashtag yeah, yeah. disloyal. Uh, yep. Check it Ain't out. Uh, that live stream is in two hours. Luke, Tea with Luke is going to be on Thursday. Yes. Right? Whoa. Sure. It's another Thursday, Tea with 12. Luke. 12 uh, CST. Uh, so Can't in order there. to gain access, people, you have to join the community. Yeah. In fact, some some of you should come and question my my some of my statements in this podcast. Please about do. The doubt should not be part of our faith. So look, come and if you want to go deeper with Luke, uh, <laughs> who is clearly the weakest link on this podcast, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you can challenge him more directly on our uh, community page. So check that out, Greg. What are you talking? I about? promise I not to know. bring up drugs this time, Luke. 
I will Thanks. refrain <sighs> from any drug commentary hey, this Luke, time around. I can't promise I won't, but I'll promise <laughs> to promise I won't. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, that's it. Love y'all. That was fun. Uh, listen, listen, and listen. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.